Hello, everybody, and welcome to tonight's panel discussion following this fantastic, fantastic film. Wasn't it good? Yeah. As a casting director and as the president of the Casting Society of America, I want to say to Joanna Colbert, one of the producers of the film, thank you, thank you, thank you for making this happen. So it's, a, it's a step forward for casting directors. It's a step forward for us all, and we thank you. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel here tonight, uh, and I will let them introduce themselves. But I'm Richard Hicks. I'm president of the Casting Society of America. I'll be running tonight's discussion. I'm a casting director for film and television. I've been doing it for about 20 years. Um, I wonder how many years between us we all have. Don't I don't count. Know. I, will, I will lose count. But I'll, uh, let's see. Who will I go to first? Let me go to you, Joanna Colbert, first. Uh, and then I'll have you guys introduce yourselves. Hi, uh, am I introducing myself? Yes, please. Hi, I'm Joanna Colbert, um, casting director and one of the producers of the film. And that's it. <laughs> Hi there, I'm David Rubin. Very happy to be here to meet you all. Yes, sir. I'm Lynn Stallmaster. And Yay! <laughs> I did not cast silent movies. <laughs> Hold the mic up for yourself. Hold the mic up. That way people can hear you. Could you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 I'm Larray Mayfield. It's nice to be here. It's really nice to be here with Lynn Stallmaster. <laughs> and I'm Sarah Finn. Agreed. So, Joanna, I'll start with you. How did this movie come into being? This movie came into being, let's see, I was Juliet Taylor's intern when I was 16. Well, what year was that? It was a mere five Three years, years ago. ago. Three years ago, yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, and uh, I had lunch um, seven or eight years ago with Kate Lacey, who was Marion's last assistant. And the two of us thought we have to honor Marion and tell her story. So we went to, so I was working at the time with Tom Donahue on a feature film, and I knew that he had made a documentary called Guest of Cindy Sherman, which is wonderful if you guys want to put that on your notes. And I said, well, you know, we want to make this documentary. Why don't you direct it? And he said, who's Marion Doherty? Um, and then seven years later, the film was made. So... Uh, that's how it all came about. Fantastic. Lynn, let me ask you. When you were in casting at the same time, did you, what was your relationship to Marion largely? Did you see, do you, you know, you were on the West Coast and she was on the East Coast for all that time. Did you, and then when she came out here, was it different then? I mean, I think now there's a feeling of collegiality among casting directors. Did you feel um, connected to her? Did you feel competitive with her? Does, you know, how was the uh, constellation of casting directors different back when you were uh, actively working? Well, you know, I was a... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was a uh, aspiring young actor. And I naturally viewed all of those live shows out of New York. This is uh -huh. in the late 40s. And uh, so I was aware of Marion, and I certainly admired the ensembles she was assembling in New York. And so I, but the odd thing is, though I always had enormous respect for her, we never met in person, nor... Ever? Ever. Ever? Oh, wait. That's... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's I'm building the... Go, go. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, finally, I was casting a film at Warner Brothers, and I was called to a meeting, which I won't go into about the meeting, and in that group were not only the producers and studio executives, but finally I met Marion Doherty. And that was in probably 1990 or something. You That's know, fascinating. After all those years of knowing 
and having high regard for her superb talent. Uh huh. I went to the um, um, New York premiere of Casting By that HBO did, and for the first time I got to meet Juliette Taylor. I don't know about you guys, but there's something about meeting casting people who I've admired forever that just I find so fantastic. I don't know, it, you know, it, like when you get to a certain level, they're amazing presences. You know, they're not just utilitarian uh, uh, people who get the job done. They are fantastic people. That's I what I'm so I think it's the, the case with actors as well. I mean, uh -huh. you, know, you, meet, you meet actors whose work you hold in such high regard and, and whose work you've, you've aspired to and modeled your own technique after. And, um, and, and I think it's, in, it's inspiring uh, and, and it sets the bar high. Uh, and that's why I was so grateful to have worked with Lynn Stallmaster early on in my career because you, I think you get a sense from the film of the lineage of casting directors. Uh, and I think what gets passed on is, is a certain work ethic uh, and also a kind of an encouragement to find a voice and to learn a vocabulary to express yourself about actors and what actors bring to certain roles and a, a certain narrative in a script. and. Uh, and Lynn was enormously influential to me, and we all have people like that in our, in our professional mm -hmm. lives, mm -hmm. uh, in imprinting a way of being um, uh, in a room. And uh, I remember... And how would you describe that way of being? Well, for one thing, a lesson that I remember from Lynn, uh, and, and, I, and I pass it on to people who've worked for me in the intervening years, is Lynn had a wonderful way of taking the temperature of a room uh, when a discussion was being had about various actors and listening to everybody's opinion so that when it came time to express his own opinion, he knew exactly how to address the concerns of everybody that were already voiced. Hmm. So, so this business of taking the temperature of a room, because as a casting person, it's not enough to have a good idea. You have to convince a room full of opinionated people, many of whom are there to essentially to take nothing away from most executives at studios, <laughs> but to justify their jobs. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to be really clever about selling your mm -hmm. vision. And I learned from Lynn that, and also above all else, that being a success in this business and being a gentleman are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> yeah. well, yeah. I just want to chime in on that note. Juliet is the most gracious, I'm sure you could tell a little bit from the film, the most gracious, authentic, kind person I've ever met. To this day, she's still my mentor and friend. Um, she used to leave the office every single day at 6 o'clock. It's a little bit of a new time now with these phones and things that we have, but she would leave at 6 o'clock no matter what, no matter how busy, to make dinner for her family. And just, um, oh, and everything had to be spelled correctly. I think you're like that too, right? Everything had to be spelled correctly. So I remember we had a role in, I think mm -hmm. this movie was called Wolf or something. A oh, wolf, yeah. Yeah, Rizzoli Bookstore Man. <coughs> and I spelled Rizzoli wrong. Two Zs. <laughs> <laughs> I only had one Z. And I had to redo the whole session sheet. Mm. Anyway, just an idea of those kinds of things. It's a mentoring it's a mentoring profession. There's no school for it. So you learn, hopefully, if you get lucky, you learn from people who also are in line with your core values. Well, Ray and Sarah, I have a question for you. Uh, you know, you two work at the moment on some of the biggest, mm, I would say, most Hollywood uh, films going at the moment. Do you, how do you find, how do you find, uh, what's your secret in maneuvering people, a group, like David describes, towards a conclusion, towards a conclusion that, you know, towards a successful conclusion? Is there, are there, is there one thing you've learned how to do well? Is there um, a skill that you didn't think you had? How does it, how does it happen? I, I wish I had had the opportunity to work with Mr. Stallmaster, but I think what David is saying is absolutely true. The better understanding you have of the people you're working uh -huh. with, the better your understanding of your director's vision, 
the more able you are. I so think. it's really about uh, completely listening to each person? Yeah, that's a large part of uh -huh. it. And then I think you can never have too much information about the project, the text, the film you're working on, and the actors you've seen. My background in college, I studied theater and I studied history, and I never realized how well the two came together for this profession, mm -hmm. because sometimes I feel like it's a giant research project. I basically have a set amount of time. I have to gather as much information as I can, mm -hmm. meaning actors. And now it's a very global process. It's not just usually the actors in LA, it's really worldwide. So we have this limited amount of time and we go and we absorb as much as we can. And essentially I feel like then I come up with a thesis and here's my thesis, here's who I believe in and here's why. And mm -hmm. as David said, you really have to find the words to articulate your vision and your beliefs. Mm -hmm. And it becomes tangible. Then something that's wildly sort of subjective and unformed crystallizes into a tangible idea. And if you understand every permutation of your choice, I think you can present it Advocate in a way that's well. convincing. Uh -huh. Any tricks of the trade? <laughs> well, you know, I, I have a much different experience in casting than okay. everybody here because I started out in music videos and commercials and cool. I didn't know anybody in casting. You know, I was okay. sitting with David one night, you know, going through David Fincher, Fincher going through, you know, all kinds of things for the next day in the shoot we were doing and we were looking through casting tapes and I at that time would sort of look through things and make notes for him on all different kinds of, of, of production you know, elements. Production you elements uh -huh. Yeah. And one night he said, you know, I, I think I think that's your thing. You know, I, I think this is your thing. Have you ever thought about doing this? And I was like, no, <laughs> not at all. I mean, so many people no, who are in casting no, never you know, thought they were being casted. You know, I mean, not that I had, not that I had any aversion to it. I just truly had never thought about it, mm -hmm. you know, and um, so I said, okay. He said, well, I think you ought to try it. So I did. But again, it was music videos, um, not to disparage those because I learned a lot. I learned how to work hard. I learned how to work fast. I learned how to work resourcefully. Um, and I also, you know, I, I learned a lot working with David through that period of time. So it wasn't until I was m much farther in my career and had done many movies that I, you know, and it's only you know this in the last recent years that I've actually come into the fold. Not because I, I didn't want to, I just didn't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought you did everything by yourself, you know? Yeah, I think casting directors often in the past used to be their own islands in yeah, a way. Yeah. And I think they've, uh, they've been, there are enough of us now that we kind of connect mm -hmm. to a larger degree than we used to. And I also have a little bit of a different experience because I work a lot for one person. Mm -hmm. I, do, I, I do other projects, which I love, but, um, and so most everything well, everything that I do with David, the decisions are made between David and I. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that level of trust of director and casting director is mm -hmm. quite unique and rare and special. Yeah. Do you, uh, one thing that struck me in this movie, have, has, have any of you had the circumstance where you actually can say you're the one and you're going to be hired? Oh, yeah. For what? Because I never have. I've said, <laughs> I can say I want... Sometimes I, I know in the waiting room. Well, well no, 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 not, I, not like I know you will be the one because other, but, but that, like Marion said, no, you're hired, you don't have to see anybody else. Oh, oh, I see, well, you don't have to have any other approval. Yeah, right. Yeah. Does anybody, does anybody I don't know have if that, that exists anymore. Yeah, I, I have that often, yeah, I do. Now, David, he's, David is, is so... He'll so sh they'll show up on the set and you'll be, they'll be the choice and he wouldn't have said, he... Will he have looked at them before? Oh, of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. He looks at everybody. But you'll say, but this is the person playing that part? Pardon me? You'll say, this is the person playing well, the one line here? Well, I'll say, this is the here. person I think is great. And David, a lot of times, will go, yeah, he, that is a great person. Uh -huh. you know? oh, but, yeah. I, uh, but, you know, it, de it depends on the sort of the hierarchy of where they fit into this, the, the script. level of yeah, the, yeah. Right. Of the ca characters. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, a lot of the times it's... And mm -hmm. David's very respectful of the process of all the people that he works with, but he has gained a certain amount of success that he's, he has a lot of free reign because what were you say, of Lynn? who he is. No, I was going to say... Oh, yeah, hold your microphone. I was going to say... <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> I haven't acted in a long time. So. <laughs> uh, 
I didn't bring my picture and resume. No. <laughs> uh, the point is this. You have to, as a casting individual, always have an open mind until a deadline dictates a decision must be made. And I can only remember one instance where I felt until the very end that I had to keep looking and not... Uh, I was casting a picture called The Apprenticeship of Duty Kravitz in Canada for Ted Kotcheff. And when I read the script, I said, Ted, you're going to want to meet every actor I show you in New York and here, but I feel very strongly about a young actor named Richard Dreyfus, and I really feel he's the answer. Well, Ted looked at me when Richard walked in like, are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, he played the role, and, and uh, but most of the time, you keep that intense search to Going find there's no time. what you yeah. feel will blend with the rest of the, the cast and satisfy the director's vision. And, uh, and you finally can finally, you can say, at this moment in time, this is the actor to play this role. I Tomorrow, somebody else could walk in. But you, you have to care, you have to, you know, never compromise. Oh, I compromise all the time. <laughs> sure, I compromise I was all the time. Say, a lot of because the guys you know, I detail are... is the I difference. Can come, in... Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, you know, you do your absolute best. You stand up for what yeah. is the best iteration of it. But you, it's a world uh, that is built around compromise and availabilities and, and you know, et cetera. It, it is so crazy that you never, I've said this before, mm. you never know where or when you're going to find the answer. And I have found the answer all over this country, in Canada, in Europe, in a work, places where I never expected. Mm. Yeah, it's a, global, it's a global world now in a way that it hasn't been. I mean, you see that yes. largely in, your, in, you know, in these it, superhero you know, searches. You can say to us, well, how can you possibly know every actor in every country in the world? Well, you have to have contacts everywhere. And as I think as you, I I think as you get more mature, I think you begin to understand what you think about something, and so you can sort through your thoughts about something more, much more efficiently the more you do it. Do you know what I mean? And so it's not like you know every actor, but it's easier to know what you think about everyone you've seen. Yes, no, yes, uh, that their problem is this, their problem is that. Uh, this is helpful here, that's not helpful, so we need to reject it. And as, as was pointed out so brilliantly in your film and Tom's film, you must never get locked in that a character has to be played with this look or that particular age or that uh, particular ethnic background. Mm -hmm. You have to keep thinking what will be honest, what will be truthful. And that's what I was just about to say. There's a relationship between what we do and the narrative and the script. Uh, because one of the first things that we do in reading a script, I think all of us would agree to this, is we sort of either literally or figuratively cross out a lot of the specifics that a writer has written into the script in describing a character, because writers in fashioning a screenplay are very often writing it for the executives that have to read it and give it a green light. So they have to be specific so that an executive who's reading a script can envision the film in their heads as they're reading it. But as casting directors, very often we cross it out in our minds, both in terms of ideally gender and race and age, to, uh, to really open up to possibilities. And as we meet actors through the process, and it's an evolutionary process, the thing that we think we're looking for at the beginning is not often the thing we think we ultimately find we're looking for. Every actor kind of, in every decision you make, changes the narrative in some way. You know, this particular, the hiring of this actor affects this scene and the telling of the story in a certain way. You make that decision, and then that sort of has a ripple effect to all the other decisions. And I mention this only because actors work so hard to you know, do their best, and, they, and everybody should prepare as hard as they can and do your best in the room, but so often what happens after you leave the room in making these decisions has a certain amount not to do with what you did in the room, but how these decisions in total affect the telling of the story. Mm -hmm. And those are the conversations that happen in those closed 
door rooms that they talk about in, in the film. It's a, it's a director and a producer and a casting director sorting out how each individual choice affects the story that we want to tell. I want to talk about Taylor Hackford and <laughs> no, his... No, no, no. About Taylor Hackford and, you know, because I think he represents a significant population uh, in Hollywood and, uh, and his contention that we don't direct the casting, that the director is the, is the center of the creative uh, decision making. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. I, I, don't, I don't think he's the norm. My you don't? No, I don't. I, my, it's never been my experience. Uh -huh. I, I'm very fortunate to work with directors who um, work very closely with the casting director. And I would say in television are, I found that more to be true than in movies. And, and I, you know, I've just had such incredibly pleasant experiences with uh -huh. the directors that I work with. And I have nothing but the kindness and respect from them and support. And I was at a dinner party last night with, I don't know, 40 people or something, and the topic of the conversation was casting by. Cool. And how important it was for everybody to see the film. Nobody mentioned Taylor Hackford. Uh huh. Nobody. I bet they didn't. Taylor Hackford was nothing to anybody there. Uh huh. It was about the film and about the casting process okay. and about the history and the relationship. So I, I, I think Taylor is a. Um, is it an anomaly? A dinosaur. Hi, Dinosaur. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, gender. I'm it has intrigued. Nothing okay. to do with age. I'm that intrigued by. I'm intrigued by thoughts. the preponderance of women and, frankly, gay men in casting. Why do we think that is, and is that is that something that's changing? Uh, you know, y you're a straight man, <laughs> and you're a casting director. You're one of mm, ten that I know. I know about ten. Uh, you're, one of, you're one of ten, I probably know, who work in film and television who are straight male casting directors. But his name is Lynn, does that count? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. That's why I gave up acting, because people were confused. Yeah. I understand. <laughs> I find it fascinating. I find it fascinating that it's, you know, here we all are in this kind of intermediary position. We're, we're, not, the, we're not directly respon we're responsible and yet not immediately responsible for creating this movie, you know, um, and I am, you know, is it, is it because, uh, why have we all found ourselves here and, and is casting less respected because it is, a, it is a job that has traditionally been done by women and gay men? I, I don't know if that, I, I don't know that. Or not. I mean, I, I haven't really know. thought, I don't, uh -huh. you know, it's like, I, I don't know uh -huh. why that okay. is, and I don't, I don't really think about it too often. I think it's just like, it is a collaboration between all the heads of departments on movies of how we come together and we tell this story in the best of, of all of our abilities. And um, But the special women, effects guy isn't usually a woman. No, <laughs> maybe yeah, not, ahead, but maybe theory? it's also, it is the one element of filmmaking where you are coming into contact with, with People. 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 And there are more mm -hmm. women that are school teachers, by and mm -hmm. large. There are more mm -hmm. women that are nurses. It's a nurturing business. Mm -hmm. And it does take a certain amount of patience and uh, care. Mm -hmm. And multitasking. And, and multitasking. Mm -hmm. And it also, it also takes the ability to set your boundaries. Because it's a very, it's like you, you have to have boundaries where you're doing this, you know, because I'm much like, like Juliet. I go home at night. Mm -hmm. I have dinner with my, my my son's grown, but I have a grandson. I go to his football game. I go to Tennessee and stay at my home there. I have a niece and nephew there that I check in on every few months. I have to keep that part of my life very, very, very rich what? in order to be able to come back and give to you all what you need and you deserve for that five or three or ten or minutes or 45 minutes that you end up being in my office. What's your theory, David? Well, just in addition to what was said, uh -huh. I think there's a, there's a kind of a psychological sensitivity uh -huh. in casting directors, both in terms of the needs of the actors, but understanding the emotional underpinnings of the script. Uh, and I think that there is something about women and perhaps gay men that, that, um, that taps into and is open to the emotional nuance mm -hmm. of a script. And I think, you know, that's a um, very important part of the conversation about what an actor brings you know, to, to a character. So I think it's a, cycle, a sensitivity to, to emotion uh -huh. that is that, another that, that, potential reason for that. Everybody and has, but, but... I also think, too, there's a nesting quality 
for that we all have as casting directors because what also I don't think people realize is that even though you're casting individual characters you're building a family that's going to go that's off and spend you, yeah, you kind of a year create, together and, then you send and it's it off. very sad at times because we're first in we're for on we're on the front line we go in we work hard oh i know i feel like the but old girlfriend at rap parties every, yeah and then it's you know, like all this interview they had an intense relationship like, with you minute, and now they're done with you it's yeah. like your kid going to kindergarten. You're like, well, they're all leaving me, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and by the time they come back, some of them forget you. Oh, yeah. But it's okay because it's still, I mean, you know, it is. It's fine. It's still a wonderful experience, and you mm -hmm. are building a family. And I think you do think about how do these people all work together and how are they going to continue on mm -hmm. to bring this family from this story to life. Cool. And I think... Gay men and women have very nurturing qualities. Uh, I used to be <laughs> an actor, and that. and I, uh, and you used to be an actor. And David, did you you acted? In, in school, and I you, did, yeah. and you didn't. No, the first and time did somebody told me, I took me to a set and told me I had to stay so, there. So we're in a room rap, full I'm of like, actors. <laughs> we're in a <laughs> not, I can't do that. I'm we're in out. a room full of actors, <laughs> and I. Is there anything that you want to say to the actors here who might be interested in going into casting? And, uh, um, you know, is there, is there, here I'll tell you what I want, what I, what I, what occurs to me is when I was 25, I, I thought acting was the only contribution I could make because it's the one I saw and because it was the most immediately um, involving and stuff. And I realize when I look back on it, I didn't really know. I didn't really know what I didn't know. I didn't really know that there was something available to me that could use more of me, and to which I could contribute. To you know, it will take as much energy as I have. Where acting sometimes will take as much as they're willing to let you give, um, and so I would encourage the actors who might be thinking of getting into it to, as you said once, leap and the net will appear. Uh, you know, uh, find your way to expression rather than find your way into needing it to be through acting. That's what I would say. Because I can tell, I can speak from personal experience, I'm a um, more, uh, I'm basically a, a happier person than I was when I was an actor because I get to do what I do a lot more of the time. Well, you know, I also, too, just one thing I want to say about that with anybody who is acting but maybe thinking that you want to do something else, I don't think, and, you know, and I think sometimes people are torn because you feel like maybe you're quitting or maybe you failed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I always say to, to people is that if you go and you try something that you think is really w what you should do, but then somewhere along the line, once you find out what it actually entails, sometimes you go, you know what, I don't have the personality for that or I don't have the lifestyle for that or I don't really have that kind of desire. I have a desire to express myself but maybe not in these parameters. So you, it's great. You go try it and then you realize from that, it's like I came out and started production of music video. I would have never in a million years dreamed that this is where I would be and I couldn't be happier. And um, so it's a stepping stone, and sometimes, and it's a wonderful experience, and it's great sometimes to go and see something that you think it's like going to college. Sometimes you start college, and by the time you finish, you're doing something else. But one road leads to the other, and it's 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 gaining knowledge. So later in your life, you look back and go, "Don't go, shut! I wish I'd done that." You know? Did you want to say you something? Come, you do it, uh, and you learn. A memory just flashed back in my head. A memory just flashed back in my head, and that is. I remember when I would go in and read for directors or producers, and whoever read with me was reading with the script in front of their face. So I think what we've all learned is get involved with the actor and play the scene. Maybe hit him with a her with a, a surprise or two, you know, with, with a mm -hmm. and yeah, find I do out that, how I they're going to react. But be engaged with the actor. Yeah. So. Not that I memorized every script and every role. And by the way, it's very gratifying for former actors to be able to give, you know, to another actor and, uh, and, and, and then watch and see the reactions. Because what acting is reacting. And it is something you don't even, even in a bad reading, you can still see the glimmer 
you can still see something is special and, and will work in that character. In a world so in which... you have to pay attention. Um, in a world in which um, movies, by and large, are getting bigger or smaller, they're, you know, mm, are becoming these tentpole things, what do we see as, do we see the cast, the contribution of the casting director as more important, as, as less important, as harder, as how does the uh, bifurcation of films budgets in a way, does that, does that affect what, how we do our job or does it not really? I personally, I'm gonna jump in here because I have very strong feelings about this. I personally think how we do our job has so much to do with the producers on a, on a film mm -hmm. or a TV show. I would agree show. with that. I really do. Not, not the director is first and, and foremost, really. Uh, I started out with a director, so I, I have, and, and he's my friend, and my life has forever changed because of him, so I obviously have a very big loyalty to him and the <coughs> other directors I work with because I know where they got to be. But the problems that I see on movies from time to time are, how much somebody comes on and they want to control what's happening instead of come in and collaborate and let everybody who's hired do what it is they do well. And that is, for me, the thing that makes or breaks, whether it's a big movie or a small movie. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It's not the size of the movie. It's not the budget. It is about if somebody's going to let you fly and breathe. I would or argue that, 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 that in you. a world of increasing budgets, and this might be Pollyanna-ish, but in a world of increasing budgets, the making the correct best choice is even more important because there's no, because if bazillions of dollars ride on it, you, you, it is incumbent, it, it is the responsibility of the casting director and the production to make the best creative choices yes. or else the money won't get made because people will not want to see it. Right. You know, Richard, a compliment to all casting directors do you realize how infrequently an actor is replaced after all that care and all of that time is spent? You don't hear very often, unless he's ill or has a problem of some sort, but you don't hear of actors mm, that's true. being in replaced. That's true. In all the, right? And all the castings okay, and all the buzz and all the... Huh? <laughs> no. oh. What do you say? No, I think... <laughs> I think that blockbusters uh, pose another problem because the, with increased budgets, the need for a safety net, for name value, for, you know, marketing executives are very much, uh, for big budget projects, are, are, are a huge voice in the, in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they determine the value of a particular actor, or you will hear, even in, in a smaller independent film, when foreign sales are a critical oh, element, yeah. we're constantly having conversations where we're told an actor that we're championing has no value overseas. Um, and then we'll be told a particular actor has value overseas, and, we're, and we and go, never really? Heard of them. <laughs> they have value Some of overseas? that is selective. We it is, and and it's entirely sure. subjective, <laughs> but it is, the, and these, these voices are, are, are heard and counted on and relied upon, and, and sometimes we're up against it when, mm -hmm. you know, those opinions are brought to bear. So that's another factor in, the, in people hedging their bets. The, the economy of movie making is precarious and, and ever more so uh, with uh, audiences shifting. Uh, so everybody's looking for a safety net, and, and it comes to actors, really, where those compromises and, 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 uh, and dictates occur, where you're told you have to have this person because they're of value. Mm. Well, and it's also, too, you know, and I think we all, we all know, know this, it's, it's also when you take on a movie like that, you do have to be respectful to the money that's being spent on that, mm -hmm. you know, and how best to, not beyond what's creatively best, but you do have to think a bit like a producer as you're, when you're casting. And, and you also, it is nice to sort of know who does have some value and who doesn't. So when people come in with this arbitrary list, you're like, well, that's not really correct. <laughs> I just wanted to ask the audience a question. Can I do that? Fine with me. <laughs> Did this film change your view of casting directors? Uh, what was it before? <laughs> are we better or are we worse? 
Yes, I know it's an interesting thing how, how, how the casting occurs in all those tiny rooms that no one except the people in that room really see, so it has a kind of a enigmatic quality to it and therefore hard to uh, assign value to or to feel like you're really in the si inside of it. And I think that's one of the major accomplishments of the movie is that you really get a sense of the contribution that the casting process may, can can often make to a film. I think actors also uh, uh, often view, and young actors just starting out often view casting directors as gatekeepers and people who are there to say no. Right. And when the opposite is true, you know, we're, we're there to say yes and are hoping that everybody arrives and provides us with the answer that illuminates the, the written word. Um, so, and the way you see the way Lynn championed John Travolta early on in his career and the way Marion championed John Voight, uh, um, you know, it's extraordinary the lengths to which my colleagues go in support of, of the actors. And uh, I think the film is really helpful and instructive to the acting community to, to realize the love that we have for what you do and the appreciation, mm -hmm. the respect that we have for you, uh, and the support that we throw behind you uh, um, when we do you know how you. much? Yeah, that's what we do. We advocate for those we love. Yeah, and and you, you look good, we look good. Yeah, that's true. And, it's, and also, too, it's not that you really, it's not like we love everybody. You know, we don't, I don't we know, well, not everybody. Everybody knows, I, I sure don't love everybody. 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 everybody knows that about me, but when it comes to actors, <laughs> well, sure. Who am I kidding? I mean, really Come on. Uh, but when it comes to actors, I do. I, I love everybody that comes into my office. Not everybody's right. Mm. Just not going to be. And and there's one person going to get whatever role it is anyway. If it's one line or if it's a lead in the movie, one person's getting that role. That's it. And what I always say to people is if you can be as prepared as you possibly can, if you can be as confident with yourself as you can, and you come in to do the best job that you can, leave it. Go out of that room and go, no matter what happens here, I did a good job. And I will tell you, it will always leave an impression on a casting director, every single one of us. Always, always, always. And many times right, down the road, however long it might be, you'll come back around in our mind. We or write we'll it on the index card. Again. That's right. <laughs> Lynn, I'll give you one of the last right words. The <laughs> what were you going to say, Lynn? Yeah. I have said to so many actors who say, but it's such a small part. I say, but work. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not coming through? No, you're good. No, you're good. Can you hear me? Yeah, can. <laughs> I've always said, as a matter of fact, I said it to John Voight when I was doing a picture called The Hour of the Gun. He said, but uh, there's not much. I said, I want you to work with John Sturgis. I want the Mirage Corporation to get to know you and all of the directors, the great directors that are working. It, it, it doesn't matter if... If it's a tiny part, you mean. If it is mm -hmm. a small role. Mm -hmm. And I've been, sa I've been saying that forever to James Kahn and to so many actors. Just do it and you will graduate. And of course, so many of these actors have come to the head of their class. And it's working, It's you're getting paid for a master class in acting sometimes with these amazing directors that you have to work with. Yeah, like with. Jeff Bridges was yeah, in that it's one. it's like, really. you know, and most everybody who's a young actor has another job. So, you know, are you going to work and make money doing what your craft is, or are you going to, you know... Well, dir go? directors recognize. And I remember Brian De Palma saying to me, who was that taxi driver? And then I used him again in a small part in Chicago that you brought me. And I said, oh, his name is Dennis Franz. He then went on to have a major role in Blowout. And then we know the rest mm -hmm. of his incredible history. Well, I'm sure the stories you could tell would be legion. And I suggest you have a symposium with this guy <laughs> and maybe one or two others. But our time today draws nigh, so I guess we, we say thank you. Thank you. Thanks okay, for having us. Thank you for coming.